Have you ever wondered if some people in psychiatric hospitals or what were once called insane asylums didn't actually belong there and were simply misdiagnosed and held against their will? Or what if you just pretended to be crazy? Would you get sent there and even though you admitted that you had been acting, you would still be thought of as crazy? If your answer is yes, you would be in the company of one Professor David Rosenhan. In 1973, Professor Rosenhan sought to investigate whether psychiatrists actually managed to tease normal and abnormal psychological states apart. As he put it, at its heart, the question of whether the sane can be distinguished from the insane and whether the degrees of insanity can be distinguished from each other is a simple matter. Do the salient characteristics that lead to a diagnosis reside in the patient themselves or in the environments and in the context in which the observers find them? So let's place this in some context. In the late 1960s, the DSM-2, or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders 2, was published, and with it came the belief among practitioners that psychiatric conditions could be distinguished from each other and from normal psychiatric good health, much like physiological diseases can be distinguished from each other and from good health itself. Along with this increasing belief that psychiatric diagnoses could be made like this, there was also an increasing number of critiques of this belief. And these critics argued that psychiatric diagnoses were not as objective, not as valid, and not as substantive as their physiological counterparts. There is no malignant tumor in the psyche that can be identified and excised via a regime of therapy and medication. The critics argued that these diagnoses were more like opinions and therefore subject to biases even when the diagnoses were made by competent psychiatrists and psychologists. Professor Rosenhan set out, as any good psychologist would, to settle the matter empirically, that is, by gathering data. He resolved to have people with no current nor past symptoms of psychiatric disorders admitted to psychiatric hospitals. The reasoning was this. If these mentally sound participants were always correctly identified by competent practitioners as not having any mental abnormalities, this would provide good evidence that psychiatrists and psychologists were able to tell normal apart from abnormal psychiatric states. Much like a medical doctor can draw your blood, run tests and tell you with confidence that you do not in fact have herpes even if you thought you may be displaying symptoms of the disease. If this was not to be the case, and the data presented differently, the critics of psychiatric diagnoses might have been right to harbour some doubts. For this quite unconventional experiment, nine participants, including the good professor himself, were recruited. All were deemed to have no present nor past symptoms of serious psychiatric disorders, and each gained admission to one of nine distinct hospitals. As the admission stays ranged between the different participants, some participants managed to gain further admission to four other hospitals. So there were a total of 12 data points in this experiment. As this was an experiment, sort of, there were some standardized procedures. For instance, the admittance, stay, and discharge process was set out as followed. Firstly, participants set up an appointment at one of the hospitals using a false name, occupation, and employment. Secondly, at the appointment, participants were to complain that they had been hearing unfamiliar, often unclear voices which seemed to come from someone of their own sex and which seemed to say empty, hollow, and thud. Participants provided truthful information on all other matters. On admittance, participants stopped simulating any of the psychiatric symptoms, though there were a few cases of, and I quote, brief and mild nervousness and anxiety, which quickly abated. In psychiatric wards, participants engaged with patients and staff as they would normally with colleagues in everyday life. When asked by staff how they were feeling, participants were to indicate that they were fine and that they no longer experienced symptoms. If participants were to receive prescribed medication, they were not to ingest it, although apparently there were one or two instances where the participants did in fact ingest their prescribed medication. Participants were discharged when the hospital staff responsible for their stay saw fit. In 11 of the 12 instances, or the data points that we have, participants were admitted on a diagnosis of schizophrenia and discharged with a diagnosis of schizophrenia in remission. 
In one of the 12 instances, participants were admitted on a diagnosis of manic depressive psychosis. Their discharge diagnosis was not reported. Generally, stays in the hospitals range between 5 to 52 days, with an average of 19 days. When talking about the errant diagnosis on admission, Professor Rosenhan stated that the reasons for this strong bias towards diagnosis are not hard to find. It is clearly less dangerous to misdiagnose illness than health, i.e. it is better to err on the side of caution to suspect illness even among the healthy. It seemed that once diagnosed with aberrant psychiatric traits, participants were generally unable to escape the diagnosis, despite their having dropped the farce quite soon after admission. Admission diagnosis seemed, in Professor Rosenhan's words, so powerful that many of the participants' normal behaviours were overlooked entirely or profoundly misinterpreted. One of the reasons for this that Professor Rosenhan suggested was that even people who are not diagnosed with mental illness sometimes exhibit strange behavior, like pacing around or fiddling and frequently writing. And in the absence of a psychopathic diagnosis, these behaviors are attributed to something other than psychopathy, such as being bored or being a writer or just being quite eccentric. However, when these behaviors are combined with the presence of a psychiatric diagnosis, these behaviors are then more often attributed to the psychiatric illness rather than being something that most people do. And even if it does seem a bit strange, the hospital itself imposes a unique environment in which the meanings of behavior can easily be misunderstood, especially with the presence of a diagnosis, even a misdiagnosis. The study had a good number of shortcomings, as I'm sure you can imagine, and this should perhaps give us some pause when using this as a critique of psychiatric diagnoses overall. But the outcomes were nonetheless intriguing. So the question remains, should a psychiatrist err on the side of caution when diagnosing patients and risk a misdiagnosis, or be more critical and risk the patient harming themselves or others because they were refused treatment? Let me know what you think. That's all for this video. Remember to drop a like and subscribe, and I'll see you all next time.